Um, okay, so this is the around the world from the palm of your hand talk. If you were looking for one of the other talks, just stay here. All right, so um, if you want to go ahead, you can scan the QR code and donate in support of UNICEF. I'll give you just a second if you didn't have your mobile phones ready. Normally, with an audience, I can actually look out into the crowd and see how many phones are pointed at the screen. So I'll just talk right now to kill time in case you didn't get it. All right, and then we'd also like to thank our sponsors. They're helping make this possible. OK, so about me, my name is Jared Rhodes. I'm an MVP for Microsoft Azure, a Pluralsight author. And if you need to contact me, um, you can use my email, my GitHub, my Twitter handle, and uh, pretty much follows this theme if you need to find me anywhere on social media. Um, I'm the owner and operator of Kimata Technologies. We do coaching, so if you need training, on-site training, learning, we do uh, consulting as well. So if you need um, sort of high-level architecture, um, um, planning, or anything of that sort, uh, we can do consulting and then finally creating. We can actually do implementations and um, build software. And uh, if you'd like to check out my latest course on Pluralsight, it's creating responsive layouts in Xamarin forms. I've got content on Pluralsight for Xamarin, um, Azure, and um, machine learning. Okay, so in this. Um, in this presentation, what we're going to do is first we're going to do a, a brief overview of the, um, I don't even know if we should call it the mobile landscape at this point, of um, the application development lands, landscape um, for anything that's not a, um, I don't know, just anything that's not server development. So we'll quickly, very quickly talk about Wi Fi and LTE, then we'll go over Bluetooth, and then we'll look at NFC, and then LiDAR, SMS. Uh, the camera and the microphone, all for these different devices. So let's get started with our overview. So we'll break it down into three categories um, for uh, current development. And again, I'm trying not to say mobile development, and it's the word that keeps popping into my head, but we really, uh, mobile is now uh, the phone, the laptop, and more. So we'll break it down into three categories that'll be native, cross-platform and hybrid. So for native development, you have, and in this case, we'll talk about it in the mobile context, you really have two choices. Um, you're gonna wanna develop for iOS. So if you wanna do that natively, you're gonna be using Objective Swift, or excuse me, Objective C and or Swift. You'll be using Apple's Xcode and you'll be using the iOS SDK. If you want to do native Android, you'll be using Java and or Kotlin. You'll be using Android Studio and the Android developer tools, and you'll be using the Android SDK. If you want to do cross-platform development, you have a few more options. So you can use React Native. So React Native allows you to use TypeScript and JavaScript, and you can use the tools of your choice to develop native applications. So React Native will compile down into a native application. It's not just a web view rendering a, an HTML page. This actually creates a native binary for your application. So you can use the tools of your choice for that, anything that supports TypeScript and JavaScript. You can do Xamarin or Xamarin Forms, which is um, it allows you to use C Sharp and F Sharp, and you can um, create applications in, in uh, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and Writer. If you are more familiar with C and C++, you can do a C++ application using C++ or any other um, language that will allow you to create a linkable library and you can use the tools of your choice. Uh, iOS supports C++ uh, through Clang. Android has the MDK, so you can use C++, and you can actually build a complete application without ever having to write a line of Java or a line of um, Objective-C or Swift. It's just, you're gonna have, you're probably, I mean, most likely you'll have to write a little bit, but you can, using those MDK or, or Clang, uh, create an entire application with just C++. And then finally, when I, when, I, when I first gave this talk, I actually did it and I did those three and then someone stopped me after and they said, well, you forgot, you know, you can create cross platform applications in all the different game engines. And they were right. I completely missed it. 
but you can create applications for Android, iOS, Windows, Linux, using Unity, Unreal, and other game engines that give you integration to create a UI in that way. And then we have hybrid applications, which I've seen less and less and less and less of. When I say hybrid applications, that means some form of um, an application that is not running true native. Uh, it doesn't compile down to the uh, native components. It actually runs partially or fully in a web view control running an HTML page. So uh, there's Cordova. So Cordova is, what was that called? PhoneGap? AirGap? PhoneGap? So Cordova is the uh, uh, PhoneGap open source. I, I forget exactly what Cordova's relationship is to PhoneGap. I know it is PhoneGap. Um, I'm just forgetting exactly if it's the open source version or, or um, not. But you can use that and you can use JavaScript and HTML to write a complete application. Just understand that it's hosted in a web view on the device. And there are plugins that you can use to reach outside of that web view and interact with the native components. And then there's Ionic, and you can use Ionic in sort of the same way, giving you that HTML JavaScript build experience to run on the app, uh, run on the device. Okay, so now that we've had a high level overview of mobile development, let's move into talking about Wi-Fi and LTE very quickly. Because one of the things I want to do during this talk is to give you an idea of what technology to use when and then what's available to you through these different devices. And obviously, Wi-Fi and LTE are available on almost all these devices. So when do we use Wi-Fi and LTE? Well, we use it almost all the time without even thinking about it. So we use it because we want the high, high data rate. Um, if we want to do video streaming, or we want to do um, large con large amount, large, what am I trying to say? You get it, high data rate. You have to use a lot of bits and a lot of bytes. You're going to have to use Wi-Fi or LTE. These other protocols aren't going to support it as well. But the main reason you're going to use Wi-Fi and LTE is because it's common. I'm sure everyone listening on this call is most likely either on the Wi-Fi where they are or they're using LTE on their mobile device. I, most places probably aren't even hardwired anymore, uh, at least for whoever's listening. And then finally, it's obvious that you're going to want to use it to connect to the internet. If I go ahead and I'm using these other things that were listed that I showed earlier, whether I'm using SMS or, or Bluetooth, the internet isn't an easy um, access point at that uh, from that uh, um, from that wireless protocol. So if I want to access servers or just any sort of backend I'm developing over the internet, I'm going to default to Wi-Fi and LTE. And that's really what I want to say about Wi-Fi and LTE because it's so ubiquitous in, in our development. I don't think I can teach you anything about Wi-Fi or LTE. What I'd rather do is I'd rather move on to talking about the other wireless protocols that you have available to you on these devices that you may not regularly use. So one of those would be Bluetooth. Bluetooth is pretty universal on devices nowadays. In fact, a lot of the chip manufacturers that make the Wi-Fi chips just have Bluetooth capabilities built in. So some of the uses for Bluetooth, you already know. The original Bluetooth component was the earpiece to the point that we all know the, the person walking by you at the airport or walking around outside talking to themselves because they have the Bluetooth earpiece in. And it has other uses as well. You can obviously use it with the same sort of technology to listen to music, but it can also be used to transfer files. I believe with the iPhone and a Mac or an iPhone and any other Apple product, it behind the scenes default connects over Bluetooth when you want to do things like local file share. So you can easily transfer those files over. And then we have tethering or um, just because I'm, I'm from Georgia, I'll call it piggybacking. So tethering or piggybacking so that I can connect my phone to another device over Bluetooth and then let that device, which is internet capable, be my internet connection or vice versa. A device can connect to my device and now my device, which has LTE or Wi-Fi, can act as the internet for that device. And you just do a protocol translation of Bluetooth to um, Wi-Fi or LTE. And that way, each device doesn't have to have its own connection. They can uh, share a connection. Um, we'll go into this a little bit more, but you can use it in advertising. There's actually a component of the Bluetooth spec 
that is built specifically for advertising and you've probably had it on your phone and you, you just haven't noticed. But advertising is actually built into the spec and is a major component of Bluetooth. And then finally, you can use it for location services. So uh, along with the advertising spec, um, Bluetooth has built in capabilities so that you can basically broadcast. So let's say, let's say you're in a store or you know, <clears throat> normally I do this with the room that I'm in, but let's say that you are in a, in a big room like a, like a theater where someone's presenting. So you're in a theater where someone's presenting and there is in the room that you're in, there's a device that's broadcasting Bluetooth signal. And then in the room next door, there's a device also broadcasting Bluetooth signal. What you can do is, is you can actually take the signal strength of the different access points for Bluetooth, sending these advertising packets, and you can determine how far you are away from each one. And that'll actually give you an indoor location. You use this uh, commonly when you need indoor location on top of GPS. So I use GPS for your outdoor location, but once you get inside, GPS doesn't work as well. So I can actually use Bluetooth and Bluetooth beacons to track your indoor movements. And I say track, it sounds really bad, but uh, you'd be surprised if you ever turn on your, your phone and, and look at your Bluetooth utilization for like the Walgreens app, you'll probably see that the Bluetooth is on in the background and it actually is using beacons to help uh, um, collect data while you're in the store. All right, so Bluetooth can be broken down into two major specs. There is the Bluetooth basic rate and enhanced data rate. This is what I'll call original Bluetooth. And if you want to program for Bluetooth or develop for Bluetooth basic rate or enhanced data rate, you can think of it as developing for a client to server application where you're just working on open sockets, meaning that there is a component where I can send bytes and I can receive bytes and I can do this as a stream. We can have an open conversation where you get bytes, I get bytes back and everything built on top of that is going to be your application determining exactly what each byte means and how to have a conversation with the other side. And you use basic rate or enhanced data rate when you want to do things like the music streaming, like the, the headphones, because you want that open streaming communication. As of Bluetooth 4.0, they came out with Bluetooth Low Energy. And Bluetooth Low Energy had two major components. One was Bluetooth Low Energy, well, it's called Low Energy for a reason, the low energy portion means that the device can go to sleep. So when you create the Bluetooth connection to a device, they actually talk to one another and they determine how often are we actually going to send information and that determines how often the device will go to sleep. And by going to sleep, if you think about if you think about how your chip, the chips in your computer actually work, once you power them on, they're always going, they're always moving. But they also have this ability think about it when you put your computer into standby mode. It goes into a, a low power state and Bluetooth low energy is a spec built for that so that we start a conversation. We determine how often we're going to talk and then you determine or once we determine that you can now go to sleep when we're not going to talk and you can enter that low power mode. To give you an idea, if you go into low power mode, um, let's say half the time. So we decide we're going to talk and you're going to go to sleep one second out of every two seconds, then we can extend the life of the battery two times. Well, if we do that one second every 10 seconds is when we're going to talk. Well, then we can extend the battery life nine to 10 times. In um, Bluetooth Low Energy, we have three different topologies. So one is point to point. So point to point is, oh, you know what? I skipped it. Let me let me step back. Actually, I forgot one thing. I told you about Bluetooth Low Energy being low energy. I forgot the second really important part, which is now there is contract based. Communication. So instead of just having raw bits and bytes that are being handed back and forth and you're determining everything, Bluetooth Low Energy actually has a, the idea of a contract. And so you can create a contract and we'll go into that a little bit more later so that now instead of building like you're creating on top of a raw socket, you can think of it more as building an application like you're building an HTTP API so that you can send this command response style of communication. OK, so now moving into the topologies, we have three topologies for Bluetooth. So one is point to point. For point to point, you can guess, right? We have a client, we have a server, we connect, and that is point to point. Now we can communicate um, directly. 
broadcast. So broadcast is what I was talking about earlier with the Bluetooth beat or the Bluetooth advertising. So now you can create a Bluetooth device, put it in somewhere, and all it does is it broadcasts a set, uh, a set of bytes. I'll just call it bytes. A set of packets that now anyone roaming and listening for Bluetooth broadcast can hear. So it has a very specific format of this is me telling you who I am. This is me telling you what company I am. And then here's the, the actual uh, broadcast that I'm trying to send you. And then as the receiver, you can retrieve that broadcast and get the information out of it. Because once we've established that first part of me telling you who I am, what company I am, the rest of that packet can change. And this is used all the time for various different things. We already talked about the Bluetooth beacons for indoor GPS. But when this was first used, it was, um, I shouldn't say when it was first used, but one of the original uses I think was the World Cup in Brazil. And Coca-Cola was using it so that when you get close to the Coca-Cola booth, it would just be sending out a broadcast and a little notification would pop up on your phone saying, come get a free Coke over here at the, at the Coca-Cola booth. And companies can use this for all kinds of different things to broadcast. We can send information to you that we can use within our application that you don't need directly uh, at all times. But if there's something important, I can show you a notification and I can do this advertising through the broadcast spec or the broadcast topology. And then the lesser used mesh topology. Mesh topology is if we go back to the scenario where you're in a room and there's a Bluetooth device that you can connect to, and then in the next room, there's a Bluetooth device. Let's keep that going. Let's say there's another device and another device. And at the end of all those devices that are way away from you, the last device can connect to the internet. What the mesh spec will allow for is if I can connect to the one that's local to me and the mesh spec has all the different ones routed out to the internet interconnected in the mesh topology, it will automatically route to the one that I'm asking for over by to get the internet. So I connect to the local one. I'm making a request to the one that's over too far for me to connect directly to. The mesh spec will actually just figure out, OK, who's all in my network? And then it'll route you through all of the different ones that it needs to to finally get you to where your request was sent and send you a response. So I'm going to start showing you some code. This is Xamarin code, so it's C sharp. So if you're a C sharp developer, it'll look familiar. Um, for each of these that I'm showing you, this is actually just Xamarin's way of facilitating the native Java or, or um, Swift in C sharp so that it's C sharp like. These will look different if you're actually programming them in the different languages I talked about, but these are the C sharp Xamarin uh, code snippets. So let's look at connecting to a Bluetooth device. It's actually as easy as this. Let's say we have a device list. And every time we connect to a device, we just want to add that device. Well, once we have our Bluetooth adapter, which is a global variable, we just do adapter, scan for devices, and when it discovers one, we can add it to a list of devices. OK, so we talked about the Bluetooth low energy spec, and, and I want to go into that a little bit more because that actually allows you to connect easily and easily create devices for your applications or clients for the app, uh, clients for the devices for your applications. So there's the GAT server. So the generic attribute profile, the GAT, is built on top of the attribute protocol, ACT, and establishes common operations and a framework for the data transported and stored by the attribute protocol. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. Let me break it down for you so that it makes some sense. So the GAT server can be broken up into four major categories, and they're hierarchical. Meaning at the top level, there's a profile. And a profile is pretty straightforward. If you were to, let's take Open API as an example uh, to relate to. So if you want to develop for an API and it has an Open API spec, you can go, you can grab that Open API spec, and now you know of the contract that's set up for you to use. It tells you all the different methods and whatever you can use for this API. The profile is the same way except the profile is at the device level. So I'm connecting to this device and this device profile tells me all the different things it can do, except it's broken down a little bit differently. 
it actually tells me all of its services. So I go and ask the device, I say, hey device, you support Bluetooth low energy because we connected. It says, yes, I do. Here's my profile. I go, oh, okay, that's a cool looking profile. What services are in this profile? Well, within the services, it tells me a set of characteristics. In the open API world, we can think of it as the service is actually what relates to the open API spec. The profile would be more of looking at a set of APIs that you need to integrate with. The service is the individual API and the characteristic would be the, the rest component of it. So let's say that there was a person and I wanted to be able to get and put and post or create, delete that, that person. Well, characteristic would be equivalent to that. The characteristic is that entity that I want to operate on. And I'm, I'm sort of using, uh, if there's any people who do Bluetooth, I, I'm, I'm gearing this more towards developers. Um, I know that the characteristics aren't entities, but you get the idea. As a developer, you would think of it more as, here's the entity that I want to operate on, and that's the characteristic. Now, within that characteristic, I can look at different descriptors, properties, and the value of that characteristic. Okay, probably so doesn't make much sense, so let's, let's break it down a little bit further. So we have the profile. That's what the device just gave me, and it said, this is all the things that I can do, and all the things are a list of services. Within that list of services, each of those services could have different characteristics. And each of those characteristics, I can then now ask for the different properties, the values, and the descriptors of that characteristic. So when I'm actually programming, I probably already know the services that are going to be available to me when I connect to a profile. Because think about it when you program an open API against an API. You don't query the API and dynamically figure out what am I going to be. No, probably before that, you generated a whole bunch of code. You decided which endpoints you were going to interact with for your application. And you didn't really care after that to ask for what the service definition was when you connected. What you really did was you said, okay, well, there's a characteristic of a person. So let me connect and I want to talk to that characteristic. So I want to create a new person. So I send a message to that characteristic and it creates a response and sends it back. So let's take a look at a predefined. So the, the Bluetooth spec, the Bluetooth low energy spec has pre-built services that you can look at the definition of. And that way, if you actually want to create a application that can connect to different Bluetooth devices that already have predefined services, they're common. You know what they would look like. So the heart rate service is known. So it actually has a unique identifier. When you pull a service in, you can check against that unique identifier. And if it is the heart rate service, you can already have a predefined way to interact with it. So let's take a look at the, the heart rate service. It's going to have two characteristics and a descriptor in the service. And the characteristics, if I'm remembering correctly, are the beats per minute. And then there's another characteristic that you use to, what was the other characteristic? I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but let's just worry about that beats per minute characteristic. So that beat per minute character, oh, I think the other one is, um, I, think, I think the other one is so that I can set alerts. So I've got beats per minute, and that is a read field. I can read beats per minute. I can't write to beats per minute. I can only read, right? Because it's, it's, it's a sensor, it's reading values would make no sense to write to it. But then there's another characteristic I believe that I should be able to write to so that I can see, I can set alerts. I can say if beats per minute goes above X or Y, now I want to receive alerts. Normally I would ask, are there any questions? But uh, if there are, I don't see any, so we're moving on. This is some code for once we've got that device. You remember we made that device list earlier. Now it's interact with the devices that we've talked about. So if I want to get the list of services from the profile after I've connected to the device, I just say get the services async. And if I want to get the characteristics from that service, I just call a get characteristics async. And if I want to read the characteristics, it'll send me the byte array. And I just say, read that characteristic. If I want to write to the characteristic, I just write and I send it the bytes. 
If I want to receive alerts for something like the heart rate monitor, I can actually subscribe to the update events by just giving the event a callback and the uh, calling start updates async. If I want to get the descriptors, you can guess. I just call get descriptors async. And if I want to read that descriptor, I can just read it. If I want to write to it, I can just write to it. Seems pretty simple, right? We can talk a little bit about the physical layer. Uh, because Bluetooth 5 added stuff to the physical layer that's kind of important, not truly important to most people in this talk, but it will cover it anyways just in case it comes up. So if we look at the Bluetooth uh, physical layer, you'll see how apps, you know, we've got apps up here at the top and then it's highlighted and it says apps and then below that's host. And then the first thing in host is the generic access profile. As an application developer, you're done. Right, you're probably not going to go anywhere below the generic access profile. The physical layer, the link layer, the direct test mode, host controller, logical link, attribute protocol, security manager. If you're building hardware, you're still most likely going to have all of that provided to you by the hardware manufacturer of the Bluetooth chip itself. However, if you are creating Bluetooth chips, then the rest of those layers are important to you. Changes in Bluetooth 5 to the physical layer. Uh, so they added uh, three new physical layers. So what we've done is, is we've renamed the Bluetooth Low Energy. The original spec is now called, the original physical layer is called LE1M. So all Bluetooth 5 devices have to have one or LE1M. It's required for all devices, meaning that all Bluetooth 5 devices are Bluetooth 4 compatible by default. On top of LE1M, we now have LE2M. So now when the de devices start a conversation, they can actually swap out of their original mode of 1M and they can swap to a new physical layer, 2M. So now they can actually have a higher data rate between the two of them. There's also LE coded, so we can do that for longer range. If we start a conversation, we say, hey, I'm going to walk away. We can change physical modes and now we can have a long range conversation. To give you an idea of the changes, there's two LE coded for distance. So you can get two times as far or four times as far and your data rate halves about each time. Now you're still looking at 125 kilobits per second, which is better than Comcast gives me sometimes. So it's still not a bad data rate and you get a, a, a decently large uh, range out of your device. And then for LE2M, you get double the speed, but a little bit less range and um, it's, it, they're, they're all optional and there's different error correction. Again, not that important to application developers, but in case you run into a Bluetooth project and all of a sudden you need to learn about Bluetooth 5, these are the primary differences. Okay, so we talked at length about Bluetooth because as a spec, it is a lot of devices support it now. Your car supports it, a lot of devices in your house. Let's talk about some of the lesser used wireless capabilities available to you on your device that you can still utilize. So let's talk this time about near field communication. So near field communication is a form of contactless communication between devices like smartphones or tablets. So that contactless communication allows you to wave your smartphone over the NFC compatible device and you can send information without needing to go through multiple steps or setting up a connection. Okay. So in, for near field communication, I want to talk about the uses and then I want to talk about the, the NFC standard. And this will go a lot faster than Bluetooth. So if you're in for a long ride, it, Bluetooth was the one we covered the most. OK, so NFC is useful for, let's say you want to connect to devices, right? NFC allows you to get two devices close together and now we can swap over to a different protocol that gives us longer range. And you see devices doing this all the time with sort of a tap to connect and then they use a different communication protocol after that. And you can use it for different things too. If you want to, let's say you're installing water meters or an appliance, you can just go ahead and install it and then have the person who's using your device just open the application, tap to whatever that, that in installation was. And if that device is NFC and you've, you've programmed it correctly, you can use the phone's, um, the phone's internet connection to now register that in your service. So we do this in the field for, let's take an example of a water meter. What I want to be able to do is, is once the installer is done installing the water meter, they now open the application, they tap it, I grab their user ID that they're logged in with, and I grab the geolocation and the timestamp. 
and we log all of that and then we start provisioning the device and our backend services to connect over the NFC. So that way when the installer is done, all they do is tap the phone and that allows the initial communication to start all the different provisioning in the background. And you can do it if you want to, like you would Bluetooth, right? If you want to, there's a good one here, disabling your residential alarm. Um, I used to have something set up on my computer, my tower that's sitting right next to me. Uh, I could just bring my phone over the NFC chip and it would turn on the computer uh, without me having to press the button. It was a neat project, but I realized I could just press the button after a while. Okay, so this NFC standard, we can break down into two major components, tags and modes. So for tags, there are four different tag types, and we're going to see if I can remember these off the top of my head because I, I didn't put them in my notes. I'm used to doing this in person. So the first two are type one and type two, small and extra small. I believe the difference in small and extra small is uh, small is 128 bytes and extra small is 64 bytes. That's the total amount of information you can pack onto this card onto this tag. So if you think about it, um, I can fit a GUID on an extra small and it's fine. So if I'm doing device provisioning, I can get a GUID, burn it to the card, put that or write it to the card, put that card in the device. And now whenever I scan, the unique identifier for that device is readily available. For small, I can, and extra small in some cases, I can actually fit a whole URL in there. So that if I need even more information, I can keep that information dynamic, but I can use the URL that's unique for that tag to go get. And the reason there's a type one small and a type two extra small, and there's such a little difference and it's so small in bytes, just has to do with price. Uh, if you want to manufacture extra small type twos, you can create, you, I mean, if you save a uh, dollar going to extra small from small, usually when you're provisioning NFC tags and you're tapping into millions, so if we can save a dollar, just going extra small, we saved a million dollars. There is type three, which is uh, Felicia. And if memory serves, Felicia just has to do with the Japanese card reader technology. So in Japan, they have a specific spec for card reader technology. And Felicia is the tag type that is compliant with Japanese card readers. So it just exists for compliance reasons. And then finally, type four is special. Type four is locked, and that is actually meant for read-write, for an actual communication. And we'll get into that in just a second. That takes us into the two different types of modes. Now, the mode we've talked up to about up to this point has been reader-writer and card mode. So reader-writer and card mode is exactly what you would think. You can see here we've got the, the tap to pay graphic, which is reader and writer. One is the reader, one is the writer, and they communicate in one burst of information. But if you want to get really fancy, and you can, you can actually go into initiator and target mode. And what initiator and target mode does is, so let's say we start in this reader, writer, and card mode, where one reads and the other one writes. Well, what if we just flipped it after we had our first read and write? And now we're communicating the other way. So you can actually create two NFC devices to have a full conversation. And it's actually a surprisingly uh, high throughput conversation if you need to transfer data or have a full conversation so that two devices can connect to one another and then rotate NFC mode and actually have a full conversation. Uh, last, when I, when, I, when I made this on my last update, I didn't update it for this talk. So there may be better Xamarin support for NFC, uh, but right now you need to do it to where you expose the NFC on each platform. So let's say we're doing it on Android. If I want to turn my, my device into a NFC beacon on Android, uh, I could just go through, I create an in-depth record, I figure out what kind of mind type and what kind of payload I want to put on there, and then I just create that, and it's a byte array uh, embedded into an in-depth record. And then whenever I want to do it, so if I'm creating that in-depth message, you can see it right here. I'm just going to grab whatever text I want, I create that ND message with an ND ref, in def record array, and then I create my mime record, the, the previous uh, slide for each message within, for each record within the message. So there's a message, there's an array of records, and within that, I'm um, looking at each message. So for the longest time, 
NFC wasn't available on iOS. It was actually on the device. There was an NFC chip and Apple used it internally for Apple Pay. And for the longest time, they just never exposed it through the SDK. Now it's available since, I don't know, 13, 11, something. It's been available for, I guess, in mobile terms a while, uh, but still pretty recent. And if you want to do it on iOS, it's um, always a simple. You just NF NFC in-depth reader session and you call begin session. You'll see this screen ready to scan and then whatever you put in the um, info P list for the uh, object name. And then you have callbacks. So did it detect? And then if it did, you'll get a list of messages. You can grab those messages. And if it did not, you'll get an, um, uh, an invalid message error and you can handle that as well. Again, this is the point where I'd ask if any questions and I don't see any chat, so moving on. This is the one I actually added for today's talk. I, this is the update. I should have updated everything else, but this is the update I made for today. So we're going to talk about LIDAR. Um, so LIDAR is a method for measuring distance by illuminating the target with a laser light and measuring the reflection with a sensor. So the difference in the return times and the wavelength can be used to make a digital 3D representation of the target. Well, what does that mean? OK, so let's say that we have a blue square, which is our LIDAR sensor. And so we go ahead and we want to scan the area around us using LIDAR. So we send it out and then it, it, it hits an object. So the, uh, the laser returned quicker and then it hit another object, it returned quicker. So what happens is, is actually on our end, as LIDAR detects, we're going to start seeing these different obscurements in our local area. So we're using, I mean, think about it, it's LIDAR, it's radar, it's actually figuring out where objects are in the 3D space. Why, well, you probably like, Jared, why, why are you telling me about LIDAR? That's neat, but uh, we're talking about devices here. Well, so recently Apple announced that the new iPad Pro is going to have a LIDAR detector built into it, or a LIDAR sensor built into it. Currently, there's no plans to expose LIDAR directly through the SDK. But the purpose of the LIDAR detector, uh, it, well, it can, have, it can have plenty of use cases. So let's go over the different use cases. You can have, uh, uh, for LIDAR, and this is general use cases, so you can have agricultural robots. They can use LIDAR for a variety of purposes, for ranging. So if it's trying to disperse seeds or fertilizer, it uses sensing techniques, as well as just uh, crop scouting and uh, looking for weeds. All kinds of stuff are done in agriculture with LIDAR. Autonomous vehicles. So uh, for most autonomous vehicle research going on right now, and even in the, the, I don't know, I think in the Tesla and a few others, they have LIDAR sensors built in so that the system can get a 3D mesh of what's going on around it to determine or to help it make decisions, right? You want to know where the, where the distance is between you and other things real time, not just by trying to look at it on a camera, but getting this LIDAR information as well. Uh, there's military applications. So there's few that are public. Um, there's a LIDAR based speed measurement of the AGM uh, 129 ACM stealth nuclear cruise missile. Uh, but there's a, there's a considerable amount of research underway in use uh, for them. So they use it for higher resolution systems to collect enough data to identify targets like tanks. So the military applications include the airborne laser mine detection system for counter mine warfare and a few of the, there's a few other different things that LIDAR is used for that is publicly known and a lot of different stuff that is uh, still classified. So airborne LIDAR uh, sensors are used by companies uh, for remote field sensing, so surveying. So one of the uh, projects I had heard about was um, we were working in a facility for, for emergency first responders. And in that facility, they actually could blow up a building and then a train on that blown up building. Uh, so one of, the, one of the projects that was going on there was actually using LIDAR attached to drones. And you, what you were trying to do was you're trying to give the first responders information about the building layout uh, as, it has, as it had collapsed. So you're using LIDAR to sort of get a, a feeling of the terrain and giving that information to first responders when they uh, couldn't get it elsewhere. It's used heavily in atmospheric research and atmospheric uh, sensing, and it's very different in that case. Uh, so we won't go into it too much, but just understand that once you send the laser into the atmosphere, it disperses in certain patterns. 
and you can actually get information. But then the big one for like the iPad Pro is augmented reality. Because once you're doing augmented reality and you're building those 3D meshes around you and in the space uh, that you're going to be, I don't know, I don't want to call it playing because it's mainly for games, but in that space that you're going to be working in, uh, augmented reality can be enhanced by having that LiDAR sensor help build out the 3D world that you're going to be operating in. So that when you take the, the classic example is in Unity or Unreal, you, you just take a sphere and you give it physics physical properties and then you start the game and it'll just drop and it'll roll around in the world that you're in that you're looking at and it understands where the slope is and it understands where that is and that can all be enhanced on the ipad pro with lidar and i think you'll see that in more and more applications or more and more devices going forward because of that application all right i'm probably going to start talking faster because i'm looking at the clock and i want to get everything in but if you have any questions just uh type them in chat Let's talk about SMS. We all, we all know what SMS is on our phone, but what we primarily use it for is texting. We can send text to each other or we can send uh, multimedia messages, right? We can send GIFs and, and videos and whatever. But uh, what's often not used, but is available within the spec is the binary mode. And you can send binary messages um, uh, if you're working at the device level as opposed to more of the um, application level. So SMS is the short message service. Um, so as it's used on modern devices, it originated from radio, uh, it, from radios and radio memo pagers that use standardized phone protocols. And these were defined in 1985 as part of the Global Systems for Mobile Communication series of standards. And the first message was sent in 92. So it predates probably some of you on this call. So for text, there's a couple of different use cases you can get out of SMS. You can create a chatbot, so you can have it to where someone can just text a number, it hits your backend services, and then your backend services can interpret what that message means, and you can have a full conversation that way without even having to make an app, um, a, a, a mobile app. You can just have the SMS endpoint be your entire interface for your user, or just a component of your interface. You can do it for notifications. So I, I don't know, I get the notifications from the Walmart pharmacy, hey, your prescription is ready, and then it just shows up on my phone, and, and, and that's what a lot of companies use. Um, and I'm sure we all use it too for the, would you like to sign in for your two-factor, here's your code. And then you can just send data, uh, raw data packaged up in a way. And since the device can read the SMS message, you can actually look at the text, maybe it's a URL, parse the URL, and uh, react to it. So if we're using Xamarin and we're on a device, this is how simple it is to send an SMS message. We just create an SMS message. We uh, uh, do compose a sync with that message we, uh, after setting the recipients and we're done. Uh, this will actually just open the native SMS application on your phone with the message populated. If you want to receive it on the back end, I'm, I'm actually unintentionally wearing the Twilio shirt but you can use Twilio, and it's actually really easy to set up a Twilio SMS ASP Net controller that will listen to the incoming messages for the um, uh, for the incoming messages, and then you can easily respond to it. As you can see from this code, I just create the post endpoint. Uh, I create a Twilio response with a message of hello from, and then you said this, and I just return it, and Twilio handles all that behind the scenes. So you can also on top of SMS, you can send multimedia, which we're all used to. So the multimedia messaging service is actually a different spec on top of SMS. So it extends the core and it allows the exchange of text messages greater than the 160 characters that you're limited to on SMS. So what can you do with um, MMS? Well, you can send about 40 seconds of video. You can send an image. You can send a slideshow, probably one smaller than, than the one you're watching right now, or you can send audio. So the SMS specification has two modes in which a GSM or GPRSM modem or mobile phone can operate, and they are called SMS text mode and SMS PDU mode for protocol data unit. And protocol data unit is how we're going to be able to send just a packet of bytes one way so that we can just do a, a sort of binary communication, I don't know where I was going with that. But yeah, so that way we can do a binary communication. So if we have, it, what we do in the field sometimes is we'll have devices that go farther out than the LTE is covered. 
and we can actually swap over to PDU mode for SMS, and we can send out binary messages over SMS, capture them on the back end through uh, Twilio, and that way we can continue our conversation with the device even once it goes far out, way far out into the field. And that is sometimes for compliance reasons too. Let's say that you're uh, uh, logistics hardware and you're going across the US border. Uh, federal law, we have to track that, so we have to keep in constant communication. Uh, just to give you an idea for, uh, I should have updated this too. This is uh, when I first made this slide. This is what it costs to send messages through Twilio. And you can see the idea. Uh, you get the idea, right? I mean, 0 0.0075 cents for a message and then 0 0.02 to send. It's amazingly cheap. And for you to actually run up a noticeable bill, you really got to send a lot of messages. Okay, so that's SMS in a nutshell. We've still got the camera and the microphone, so we'll go through those really quickly so that I can get to the questions at the end. OK, so the camera. Let's cover five things. We're going to cover object recognition, computer vision, uh, barcodes, optical character recognition, and facial recognition. Some of these overlap, but you get the general idea. These are all use cases that we have for um, the camera on these devices. So for image processing, you can think of it, or at least I think of it in four different ways. So one would be formatted images, which we'll go over in the next slide. There are algorithmic ways to take a look at images. There are data driven ways to look at images or, or process images. And then finally, you can combine those uh, algorithmic and data driven and have a, a multi factor approach. So formatted images, you've already seen them in this presentation, right? Barcodes and QR codes. Um, I was doing work for National Cash Register, and if you go up and use a NCR checkout, uh, self checkout, you can just use the mobile app for most of these stores, and it'll present you with a QR code, and you just scan that QR code and you check out. Right? So I can actually embed a large amount of information. I've actually got one of my side projects, is these are defunct Izon view cameras, and the way they connect when you kick them off is they use the camera built into them and your phone actually creates the QR code and it reads the QR code off of your phone so that it knows how to connect to your Wi-Fi and provision itself. So you can use formatted images both to send messages to your device or you can create a QR code to send messages to uh, another device as a way of <clears throat> sending that dynamic information. Sort of the same way the NFC can do reader writer, right? We can have a full conversation with barcodes if we wanted to get really fancy. Barcode scanning in Xamarin is a uh, pretty simple and robust at this point. If you use the uh, ZXing, Z, Z, X, Z, I don't know how to exactly pronounce it, but ZXING uh, NuGet package, you just, there's a barcode scan uh, click event. So you gr grab the barcode scanner object, you add a click event, and then you just, hey, uh, give me a scan and, and tell me what the results of the, the text coming out of that uh, barcode scan is. Simple as that. So uh -oh. I didn't update my QR codes. Uh, so last time I gave this talk, that was actually a QR code with the, the URL of the talk of the conference I was at. And then here's one for my uh, plural site course. I can just you just scan those barcode scanner. It takes you straight to that website. For algorithmic image processing, we've got a couple of different things. I'm going to go through them very quick. These are full topics. You can you can have experts that have lifetime of experience with them. Um, I don't have that. I'll go through them really quick so that we can stay on uh, time. So you can use histograms. Histograms give you a general idea of color gradients. So if I take a look at an image and it is green, let's say I take a picture of a forest, I can use a histogram of that to compare to other images. This works for quick matching, right? If I have pictures that have nowhere near the same color gradient, it's an automatic rejection. I know these pictures aren't similar. However, it can sometimes see a forest, a green forest as a pile of money, and it just wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So it's for that quick gradient check, and you can filter out images quickly. You can do template matching, which is sort of a way to do, um, let's say we take a large picture of the Mona Lisa and a small picture of the Mona Lisa. If I want to find the large picture of the Mona Lisa, and I have the picture of the small, I can use template matching to basically look for that exact picture, but maybe not the same size. So template matching will be able to extrapolate, say, hey, that's the same picture if we expand it out, and um, it's the exact replica of this picture. 
<laughs> and then we have feature matching. Feature matching is a much more in-depth topic, but you can do something like a key point analysis, which is using different algorithms that can look at an image and determine what are the, and we'll put it in quotes, important parts of this image. And you can take two images, take those important parts of those images and compare the distance between the important parts and determine how closely related these images are. And that's a good way to take it if you're looking for images of things that just are not in the same rotation orientation or maybe not even fully similar, but look similar. For data driven. I want to um, interrupt you, Jared. I want to interrupt you and let you know what uh, we're 10 till the hour and we do mm -hmm. have one question. Oh, I do. Where are we at? What's your opinion on .NET MAUI and you think it will dominate cross-platform UI? Okay, so the question is, what's your opinion about .NET MAUI and do you think it will dominate the cross-platform UI market? Um, as of right now, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot, um, but it seems like MAUI is a rebranding of forms as they recreate, um, as they recreate it to sort of uh, take away some of the stuff they don't like anymore. I mean, Xamarin Forms is now, how old is it? Eight? seven, eight years. It's old enough, six years. It's old enough to where it's generated enough or the market and the libraries have changed enough and C Sharp has changed that I think they're just sort of doing it to get a fresh start in the same way ASP.NET Core was. So I think Maui will dominate sort of if you think basically Maui is just going to be forms again. However you think forms is doing is how you is how Maui will do. For me, forms has been great. I've made tons of apps. They're in the store. They do well. They're performant. I think Maui will just be a more performant way to do that once they hammer everything out. Okay, so um, I'll be wrapping up shortly. I've got this, the microphone, and then put your questions in and I'll keep a lookout for them. Okay, so for the data-driven approaches, you're thinking about um, the machine learning and the AI-driven approaches. So just to go through those real quick, you can actually still use OpenCV. So OpenCV is still available and it actually has a bunch of the different stuff that we, a lot of people think of TensorFlow or, or any of the other machine learning, PyTorch. OpenCV has a lot of stuff built in that is in TensorFlow and in PyTorch available to it that you can actually do some pretty uh, intense machine learning for images in it. And there's also, as I said, TensorFlow, uh, CoreML. So I put TensorFlow and CoreML specifically because TensorFlow for Android when you want to run your model and then CoreML for iOS. I'm going to skip through the next slide because it's not relevant. It's, it's um, cognitive services, and they're real easy to do uh, computer vision with and uh, um, facial recognition and stuff like that. You can easily just send it a file, and it gives you a list of features back that it thinks that file has. So the microphone. All right. The microphone, you can really think of it in, in for two separate things. Uh, one would be audio detection and language processing. So for audio detection, what we're doing is we're, we're it's a process that we can infer if a sound or sounds is found within a set of sounds. So what does that mean? So there are these audio detection devices on the uh, stoplights in places like Chicago, and those devices can actually be used. They, they detect gunshots, and if you have multiple of them, you can detect the uh, center point for those gunshots going off, and it helps for response times. You can also use audio detection, let's say we're on a factory floor. So if you're on a factory floor, you can use audio detection to sort of determine, is this person in a place they're not supposed to be? Is this a dangerous piece of equipment and we've got the audio profile for it? And have they wandered too closely to that when they're supposed to be outside of it? And I can't track you any other way because of all of the other, and we'll say noise, but I mean more um, wireless noise on the factory floor. The other way the microphone can be used is uh, language. So we all remember back when Siri, um, OK Google, Cortana were supposed to be the, I mean, the life changing things that they were supposed to be. And we still are supposed to have that with the um, Alexa. So you can use it for assistance, right? Just let me let me hey, set a set a meeting in my calendar intent recognition um, and uh, sort of the same way you could do the chatbot as we talked about earlier. Now we're just instead of text, we're using direct audio. If you're using cognitive services with Lewis, you can use the audio stream directly. You don't even have to worry about parsing out the text in your own uh, code or backend service. So you just tell it, you know, speak into the phone 
And then on the back end, it will do the intent and entity recognition for you. And then finally search. I want pizza. Where are they serving pizza nearby? This is an example of a, a Lewis request. So if I want to send in that request to Lewis, I'm showing you the text version just because it's easier than showing you the, um, well, it just makes more sense than showing you the audio version because the audio version is just an array of bytes. So for this, you want a prediction request. So turn on the bedroom light. I send that up to Lewis. This is how I call it. I say, um, get the slot prediction. I give it my app ID. I tell it the slot name, production, and then I give it my request. The response it gives me will look something like this. I just say, get the prediction async. It'll give me what my query was, and it'll tell me all of my different intents, ranking them by the probability that that was the intent I was looking for. And then as a helper, it'll just tell me which was the top intent so that I can just quickly say, what do we think they were looking for and create an action based on that? OK, so what did we talk about? Well, we went over. What are we talking about? We did a brief overview of mobile development or device development. I keep going mobile device development. And then we looked at quickly Wi-Fi and LTE, not quickly Bluetooth, and then NFC, LiDAR, SMS, the camera, and the microphone. Okay, so I'm going to go back and see if there are any more questions. Nope, just .NET Mac. All right. This is the QR code for your speaker feedback and your event feedback. So if you would like to now go ahead and scan those. Remember, if you scan the speaker feedback, it's only if it's out of five stars, it's only five stars, right? And in fact, if you didn't like the topic, don't give any feedback. Um, and then you can also do the event feedback as well. So I was just killing time, so giving you time to scan it. Hopefully you've scanned it by now. And that's it. I'm Jared Rhodes, and this was a talk about controlling or running the world from the palm of your hand. Thank you for coming. That's it. Thank you, Jared. That was awesome. I hope everyone enjoyed it, and thank you for your contributions to a great cause. All right. Hope everyone has a good day. Good day. Bye.